top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. This weekend, Carolyn Dubois, Olympic amateur standout Carolyn Dubois, was in action against Martina Horgaz. She stopped in 49 seconds. 49 fucking seconds into the first round. You know, power. Power is one of those things to where either you got it or you don't. Like speed or athleticism. These physical attributes, not to be confused with skills. Mechanics. You know, the difference between throwing a lazy jab and a proper jab. Those are skills, whereas... Power. Power is God-given. You can sharpen it, amplify it, but you have to have it in order to do so. Power is one of those things to where either you got it or you don't. Carolyn Dubois, she's got it. Oh, I noticed it in her pro debut, her very first fight, which wasn't that long ago, that even though it didn't end in a knockout, one or two more rounds and it would have. Carolyn was in action on the undercard of React Paw versus Juma. I told you, I'm very high on this fighter. I'm sold after just two. After just two pro fights, I'm sold on Carolyn Dubois. A spiteful puncher. A threat. A southpaw. An Olympic amateur standout turned professional boxer that just advanced to a professional record of 2-0, having recorded her first pro knockout. 49 seconds into the first round. Oh, for gut busting body shot. Carolyn, no what header. I expect to see Carolyn Dubois at least two, maybe even three more times this year because when fighters first go pro, they usually fight frequently. This fight having ended in a round, they can get Carolyn back out there next fucking week. Sensational. Carolyn Dubois, very young, campaigning in the lightweight division at this time, but given her physical dimensions, I could very much see her ending up at 140, even 147 pounds. She's only 21 years old and she's exhibiting this kind of power. At 21 years old. Just 21 years old and this is how hard she's hitting these broads. This is what I meant when I said last week that Carolyn Dubois is not going to need much time to transition from an amateur style to a pro style because some way she's already there. Excellent fucking show and congratulations to her. Also in action this weekend down there in Argentina, unbeaten light flyweight IBF champion Evelyn Bermudez, the younger sister of Daniela Bermudez, multi-weight champion Daniela Bermudez. Her younger sister Evelyn was in action against Deborah Rengifo. And I told you guys ahead of this fight that Deborah Rengifo is the kind of fighter that just falls short of elite, falls short of the mark. She's capable up until a certain level, but she runs into an Evelyn Bermudez. She's gonna run into a wall. Evelyn Bermudez, the younger sister of the more well-known Daniela Bermudez. Evelyn Bermudez, this division's IBF champion, unbeaten IBF champion, who now advances to a professional record of 16 wins, no losses, no draws, with six knockouts. And this fight, this weekend's fight, wasn't just for the IBF title. This weekend's fight was a unification match for what is the newly vacated WBO title that used to belong to Senecia Estrada before Senecia was put on. She was forced to vacate because the WBO didn't want to let her hold two alphabet titles at two different weights. So she decided to vacate the WBO title at light flyweight to hang on to the WBA title at minimum weight, where she aspires to unify with Yo Costa Valle. No word on when that's supposed to happen. Better still, this weekend, Evelyn Bermudez was in action and she beat the living hell out of Deborah Rengifo in a bar. She forced a fifth round TKO referee stoppage. The referee saw Deborah had had enough. Evelyn Bermuda, she's really something. Chip off the old block is what she is. And, you know, last year, she took on Tamara DeMarco, stopped Tamara in about nine rounds. That's the same Tamara DeMarco that just pried the WBO flyweight title away from unbeaten Ana E. Lopez. That's right. Tamara DeMarco, one and the same. That's the same Tamara that Evelyn stopped last year. That victory's aging well. The landscape at light flyweight is changing quickly. Evelyn Bermudez is now this division's only unified champion. There still is the WBC champion of Mexico, Yesenia Gomez, who's supposed to be in action very soon against Kim Clavel. And in that fight, I think the title's going to change hands. I think Kim Clavel is going to be this division's next WBC champion. We know the WBA title changed hands very recently from Jessica Tutibab to Jessica Niri Plata of Mexico. Tell you what I think, I'll tell you what I think. I think that if Kim Clavel beats Yesenia Gomez, she's gonna move to unified titles with either Evelyn Bermudez or Jessica Niri Plata. That's what I think, because Kim Clavel is as game and up and comer as game up and comers come. That fight's supposed to go down later on next month on the 25th. At the Montreal Casino in Montreal, Quebec. Canada. I think this weekend's newly crowned unified champion of Argentina is going to be a person of interest moving forward for Kim Clavel, provided Kim beats Yesenia. Kim Clavel, she's really not the biggest puncher per se, but what she is is a very well-schooled boxer, educated
educated and balanced. And I think she's got what it takes, especially in her own neck of the woods, to pry the green belt away from Yesenia Gomez. Look for that in April. And congratulations to Evelyn Bermudez for quickly becoming this division's most dominant force, most dominant champion. And super middleweight news, I'm sure many of you have heard by now. Eddie Hearn has revealed that Demetrius Andrade's contract with Matchroom is set to expire after his fight with Zach Parker on May 21st. He said he does not expect it to be renewed as they've been unable to secure big fights per pro boxing fans. So now Devin Haney's not a Matchroom fighter and neither is Demetrius Andrade. There's a question as to whether or not Matchroom failed these fighters, failed Devin Haney, failed Demetrius Andrade because they were unable to get those fighters the big fights. But it was wasn't for lack of opportunity or lack of trying. They did try to get those guys the big fights. It would be very convenient and very cheap to say that Matchroom felt Devin Haney whilst paying him millions upon millions of dollars to do his fights and promote his shows. The same could be said for Demetrius Andre. It would be rather convenient and cheap. A gross oversight to say that Matchroom felt these fighters when it's not Matchroom that felt these fighters. They tried to get these fighters the big fights, but these fighters... They were being frozen out. Is it Matchroom's fault that Ryan Garcia, a Golden Boy Promotions fighter, didn't want nothing to do with Devin and Haney, is that Matchroom's fault or is that Ryan Garcia's fault? Whose fault is it? Same applies to Javante Davis. Is it Matchroom's fault that they couldn't get Davis or his people interested in doing a Devin Haney fight? Is that Matchroom's fault? Now apply that formula to Demetrius Andre. While Gennady Golovkin might have been in bed with Matchroom, they can't force him to fight Demetrius Andre. If Matchroom couldn't make an Andre versus Golovkin fight, that has more to do with Gennady Golovkin than it has to do with Matchroom. Matchroom can't force that guy's hand. They can't force him to fight. When it comes to Canelo, nobody can force Canelo to do anything. Canelo does what he wants, when he wants. He's the captain of his ship, and Matchroom is along for the ride. They're happy to be there, but make no mistake. It's Canelo Alvarez in the driver's seat, and Canelo wasn't interested in Demetrius Andre. They were willing to overpay Jermall Charlo to bring him over for one fight. But Jermall Charlo didn't want to do it. Neither did his handlers. Is that Matchroom's fault? I mean, essentially what I'm getting at is it takes two to tango. It always takes two to tango. It takes two guys to make a fight. Two teams. But it only takes one to fuck it all up. So when it's all fucked up, we're going to blame Matchroom even though Matchroom tried? If Demetrius Andre ends up beating Zach Parker and becomes the WBO's mandatory challenger at super middleweight, I don't know where he goes from there. It's hard to imagine he'd sign to Queensbury. Maybe he goes to Probellum. Maybe he goes to top rank. Hey, hey, maybe he'll go to Showtime so he can get closer to a Charlo fight. Closer to a David Benavidez fight. Just a few weeks ago, David Benavidez expressed an interest in doing a fight like that, so maybe now that Demetrius Andre is set to become a network and promotional free agent. He goes over to the Showtime side of things, maybe inks a deal with the PBC, who have a number of notoriable super middleweights, familiar ones. Maybe he sees about doing that. Hey, hey, he's got to beat Zach Parker first. He does, and if he does, who knows where he goes? Who knows what he does? Maybe he works with Matchroom, continues to work with Matchroom on a fight-by-fight -fight basis as opposed to inking a multi-fight deal. He's got to make it through this Zach Parker fight because if he does, he will become the WBO's mandatory challenger and be in a pole position to fight for the WBO title. The added value of a champion. Seeing himself become a three-division champion might be enough that maybe Matchroom decides to stay in the Demetrius Andre business. Though I question as to whether or not that's what Demetrius Andre wants. Really don't know. You think he wants a change of decor? I think he's 34 years old, and at his age, he wants the big fights. That's what I think, and at this point, he's going to go wherever he has to go to get them. I don't think Matchroom failed Demetrius Andre or Devin Haney. I think, if anything, the sports infrastructure led them here. Matchroom doesn't have full agamonical control to where they can make any fight they want. So how can it be Matchroom's fault that Demetrius Andre hasn't been able to fight in a big fight when they've been trying to get him big fights, but they can't force these guys to do it. Ultimately, the main thing now is beating Zach Parker. Before it even becomes about where Demetrius goes from here, he's got to get past Zach Parker. Yeah, he's got to beat that guy. The whole thing reads like a play to freeze both Eddie Hearn, Matchroom, and DAZN out of the American boxing scene by forcing certain situations to come into fruition, to come into being, that Devin Haney versus George Cambosos Jr. doesn't happen unless top rank is at the helm and ESPN is the broadcaster, at least here stateside. Wouldn't be surprised if Andre versus Parker ends up on ESPN too. Frank and Bob, they're old buddies, aren't they? They got a thing going. Frank Warren won the purse bid for Andre versus Parker. The whole thing, everything 
thing we're seeing, everything in its entirety, feels like one big play to freeze Eddie Hearn out of the American boxing scene and stifle as many of his plans as they can. Devin Haney's new co-promotional deal with Bob Arum's top rank and Lou DiBella for the George Kimbosos Jr. fight includes a rematch clause. If Haney beats Kimbosos twice and stays at lightweight, Vasil Lomachenko reportedly could be next. And that's been a contentious subject. The Haney versus Lomachenko fight that never materialized, that never was, because the people at top rank, they had other plans for their fighter, their fighters, and they didn't include Devin Haney. But now, now that he's inked a deal with them, you see how it breaks down. The real question here is whether or not Devin Haney's gonna stay in the lightweight division for approximately three fights. Three fights. Devin Haney's growing. a rather he's big. big lightweight, isn't he? And he's young, so his body's getting bigger. He's still growing, you know. And think about it. If he beats George Camboso two times in George's neck of the woods. If he does this, if he can make the 135 pound limit two times to honor this arrangement, this engagement, is he going to want to give a solo Machenko a chance at all those belts? I'm not going to make any bold proclamations, but that's a legitimate question. Being on a top-ranked ESPN side of things affords Devin Haney certain opportunities at certain fights. Vasil Lomachenko is just one of them. Teofimo Lopez, he's also over there, and he's a bit worse for wear these days. He's supposed to be moving up to 140 in his next fight, and at some point, Devin Haney's going to join him up there. At some point, Devin Haney's going to move up and wait. If he stays in bed with top rank, he'll be in the right place to get the fights. The right fights. Mike Coppinger himself stated, Devin Haney said he would accept the same deal as Vasil Lomachenko to make sure the fight with George Kambosos was finalized, and he received a lot of doubt. But Devin and his father Bill made this monster fight happen. Devin's still just 23. Big credit to them. Dan Canistota. It's Kenobi. Obi-Wan Kenobi of CompuBox stated, Devin Haney has fought on Showtime, DAZN, and now ESPN. Banked several millions. Undisputed fight is next. All at the age of 23. He's playing this game just right. Dan Kaleidoscope's telling the truth. It's Kenobi. -o. Dan Canopy hit the nail on the head. Devin Haney, the last couple of weeks, last couple of months, hell, a little over a year. He's been the recipient of a lot of criticism that I felt he didn't deserve because it's not his fault the top-ranked petition for franchise status. These guys call him an email champ. Without addressing why it was, he received that email in the first place. He received that email because the people at top rank franchised Vasil Lomachenko. That's what happened. I always leave that part out when they start talking about email champions. I myself questioned whether or not this fight would happen. I did. Given what Devin Haney would have had to do to get it, I questioned as to whether or not he would just bite the bullet and do what he's got to do to be a part of the biggest fight of his career because he's at a turning point. He's at a turning point now that will define the rest of his professional boxing career. And I questioned as to whether or not this would happen and what would he do. Devin deserves credit from his critics most of all. The guys who were running around calling him an email champion. If you find yourself here and now struggling to give Devin Haney his just due for doing what he's got to do to make this fight happen, clearly your issue with Devin has nothing to do with boxing. What grade would you give him as a promoter? As a promoter? <laughs> Javante Davis declined to comment, didn't want to give Floyd Mayweather Jr., his promoter, a grade on his ability to promote fighters, him being promoted by Floyd himself, well that says a lot. Floyd Mayweather himself on Javante Davis, his contract being up and the hubbub that that's created the last couple of days, he said, nothing lasts forever, I will always love Tank. He has to do what's best for him. I feel like I've done a great job thus far, building him up and putting him in great fights. I'm proud of him. Do we know if any of this is even real? We don't. For all we know, from where we're sitting on the outside looking in, this could be a ploy to promote what is Javante Davis's last fight with Mayweather Promotions. It could be a marketing tool, for all we know. We don't know if there's any truth to this and won't know until the fight is over. That's when we'll know. Based on what Javante Davis decides to do afterwards. Not being with Mayweather Promotions doesn't necessarily mean that he won't still be with Al Heyman and his PBC. It doesn't mean that he's gonna leave Showtime outright. Perhaps he strikes a deal with them independently without Mayweather Promotions as a middleman. Without them involved. Though so, hypothetically speaking, if he were to go that route, well, that doesn't herald much change now, does it? No. If he stays in bed with Showtime, if he stays in bed with Al Heyman, he'll still more or less be isolated from the other lightweights that are out there. You ask me, yes, me. what's the best place for Javante Davis to go? Yes, me. If all of this is true, 
and he has some intention of changing his decorum, leaving not only Mayweather Promotions, but Al Heyman and Showtime behind. The best place for Javante Davis to go at this point in the juncture, given today's landscape at 135 and 140. The best place to go would be top rank. They basically have George Kambosos and Devin Haney and Teofimo Lopez and Vasil Lomachenko. I mean, if Javante Davis wants to give his career and what remains of it a shot in the arm that would surprise a lot of people and get people talking, actually get them excited, top rank would be the place to go because they've got the fights, they've got the fighters, they've got the belts. Most of, not all of them, at 135 and 140 pounds. I think that would surprise a lot of people. Now, I'm not saying that he will or won't, given the unpredictable nature of the sport, especially these days. There's no telling what might happen. Maybe he does have some intention of giving his decorum a complete overhaul, or maybe all of this is just a marketing ploy to sell a fight that's a bit of a tough sell, because nobody thinks highly of Rolly Romero's boxing, and that's the guy he's supposed to be fighting in his very next fight. Which wouldn't be so bad if it weren't being billed as a pay-per-view. We're not going to know if there's any truth to any of this until after the Rolly Romero fight is over, assuming Gervonta Davis wins, if he so decides to change his decorum, if news breaks that he's inked a deal with Top Rank or Matchroom or Golden Boy or somebody, anybody, we're not going to know if there's any truth or anything to this story until after the Romero fight is over. Wait, doesn't Gervonta Davis have a court case pending for a DUI? <laughs> about a DUI, but I know that there was some kind of vehicular accident in which Javante Davis fled the scene. It was reported last year, and he was supposed to be facing a lot of time for that. I don't know what's going on with that story. It hasn't been widely reported here in 2022, but I wonder if that might not have something to do with what we're seeing and what's been going on. There's been no real mention of that court case. I haven't heard a lot about it this year. I haven't heard really anything in reference to that entire situation. Who knows what's going on behind the scenes, behind the curtain. What we do know is we won't have confirmation of Javante Davis making some big move or anything of the sort until the Romero fight is over. Then we'll know. Floyd does sound like he's saying goodbye, though, doesn't he? It sounds a lot like Floyd knows something that we don't know, that he knows just how discontent Javante Davis might be with his current situation.